Hello everybody and welcome to the quick and dirty history of Unix and BSD. My name is Kevin Sweeney and I'm a tech and open source enthusiast located in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. In this video, we're going to go back in time and briefly cover the history of the Unix operating system. We'll also cover the creation of the Berkeley software distribution and key points in the history of BSD. And then we'll briefly cover the FreeBSD project, its beginnings and where it is today. As discussed in the introduction, we're going to go back in time, all the way back before BSD and to the time when the Unix operating system itself was born. The time was the late 60s, where punch cards and magnet tape still ruled the roost. And things like floppy disks were yet to become mainstream and CD-ROMs weren't even a glint in their inventor's eyes yet. The story starts with two men who eventually became the most influential people in the history of computing. The principal developers of Unix, Dennis Ritchie, and Ken Thompson. Thompson and Ritchie had just finished working on the failed project Mutalix, or Multiplex Information and Computing Service. There was a joint collaboration between Bell Labs of American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and General Electric, GE, that had started all the way back in 1956. Mutalix was an influential early time sharing system designed for the General Electric's GE645 mainframe and it had introduced features such as dynamic linking, multi-processor support and the hierarchical file system, features that all modern operating systems have today. Even though the bosses at Bell Labs had ended all projects related to operating system development, Thompson and Ritchie continued to develop their ideas along with their colleagues on what an operating system should look like. Trust me, it's not what you think. Computers looked a lot like this back then. Not even this, or this were around yet. Thompson and Ritchie started developing their UnMultiplex Information and Computing Service, or UNIX, on a Digital Equipment Corporation Program Data Processor 7 computer, or the DEC PDP-7. They happened to be lying around unused at Bell Labs. But it was not long before the unofficial project soon outgrew the capabilities of the PDP-7 and they needed a shiny new computer. So what do you do when your own bosses won't get you a shiny new toy? You can't <coughs> persuade another department to buy it for you, of course. The patent office at AT&T needed a new word processor to help streamline the task of filing patents of which they do on a daily basis. So Thompson and Ritchie promised that they would deliver said word processor if the patent office bought the computer. In the end, the team got access to a then brand new PDP-11 and in exchange the patent office got a new word processor to help file their patent applications with. The fact that the team had to develop the operating system first before said word processor, that was a minor detail. From this beginning, the Unix operating system soon found itself going from strength to strength, even finding its way to other PDP 11s across AT&T. With the invention of the C programming language by Dennis Ritchie, coupled with the rewriting of large parts of Unix in this language, made porting Unix to other systems that much easier. This ultimately allowed Unix and its source code to be licensed out and used by other institutions and organisations outside of AT&T. And by the mid 70s, it had arrived at the University of California. By the mid 70s, Unix had arrived at the CSRG, or Computer Systems Research Group of the University of California, Berkeley. It was not long before the students of the CSRG started writing and developing software for Unix, and other universities and institutions had started taking interest in their software. A grad student by the name of Bill Joy started compiling their add-on software for Unix and by 1978 the first Berkeley software distribution or one BST was released to the world. Soon more capabilities and software were developed and two BST soon followed. One pivotal moment in the history of BST was the arrival of the Dex Fax minicomputer which had introduced modern hardware features such as virtual memory. 
to the mini computer market. It was soon apparent that the provided version of Unix for the VAX did not take advantage of these features. Undeterred, the students of the CSRG started rewriting much of the core of Unix, and it was not long before they had a version that took advantage of these features. And thus, free BSD was born. As the years progressed, the team kept working hard on improving BSD, and before long, Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, or TCPIP, had landed in the 4 series of BSD. This was a significant milestone in the history of the modern internet, as the networking stack that was developed at Berkeley was used by almost every modern operating system at one point in time, including Windows. It was the same networking stack found in the next computer, the same system used by Tim Berners-Lee when he created the World Wide Web file at CERN. As BSD was growing and was nearly an operating system in its own right, the decision was made to remove as much of the AT&T Unix code as possible. Because at the time, in order to use BSD, you had to have a license for Unix from AT&T themselves, which was becoming increasingly more and more expensive by the year. Therefore, there was efforts made to provide releases of BSD without the proprietary AT&T code. This effort resulted in Networking Release 1, or commonly known as NET1, which was freely distributable under the permissive free call clause BSD license. Though NET1 was not a usable operating system on its own, a bit with some pieces missing, but it was not long before it was followed up by NET2 release. NET2 was a more complete operating system than NET1, but still had a few pieces missing, stopping from being a complete system on its own. Regardless of the missing pieces, NET2 was important for, the for it was the basis of two ports to the Intel 386 architecture, as used by the IBM personal computer and various other clones at the time. There was the free and open source 386 BSD and the proprietary BSD 386 by Berkeley Software Design, or BD BSDI. Yes, highly created name, yes. 386 BSD was started by Lear and William Jollitz in 1989 and was instrumental as it was direct ancestor for projects such as NetBSD, OpenBSD and FreeBSD, as well as many others. BSD386, later BSD OS, was a proprietary product sold by BSDI at a price much cheaper than AT&T's Unix. At the time, Free, BSD386 could be ordered by the 100-inch Unix phone number. That really catchy phone number did have the unwanted effect of drawing the eye of AT&T's Unix system laboratories, which owned the copyright for the Unix name. This did result in a lawsuit in 1991 putting the legality of all the BSDs in question, arguably giving Linux a small advantage until the lawsuit was settled in 1994. As a part of the settlement, 4.4 BSD Lite was released with the disputed files removed, which won't work many. In turn, Unix System Laboratories, now owned by Nobel, had to have the files in Unix that were from BSD carried at Berkeley copyright notices. It was a mostly a win win. The result is that any operating system that was based on 4.4 BSD Lite was now legally in the clear. But all good things must come to an end. The Computer Systems Research Group itself was wound down and disbanded in 1995, leaving behind a hugely significant contribution to the history of computing, with many technologies developed at Berkeley still being used today. Bill Jollis's 386 BSD was growing in popularity owing to the fact it was free and open source and it ran on inexpensive personal computers. This allowed the general public access to a real Unix-like system without having to spend a fortune. But even with Bill's improvements to the system, it was not perfect and there were some issues. But being open source, users began to come up with patches for issues themselves. It was not long before there was a large number of patches spread across various Usenet servers of the early web. That 386BSD users would have to draw through in order to find the patches that they needed. In order to make the task of patching easier, a fellow by the name of Terry Lambert created the, what would 
become known as the unofficial patch kit. But it was not long before the patch kit itself became exceedingly large and unwieldy to handle. So the three patch coordinators by the name of Nate Williams, Rod Grimes and Jordan Hubbard approached Bill Jollitz with a plan for a project. The project was to involve taking a snapshot of 386BSD, apply all the relevant patches and then clean up all the code. This snapshot would be released as, as its own version. But the project soon drew to a halt when Bill decided to withdraw his support. Undeterred, the patch kit maintainers decided to carry on with the project under a new name, with suggestions such as BSD 386, 386BSD, or F86BSD for short, but thankfully sanity prevailed and they settled on the name 3BSD. Don't know why. I think it was a 90 something to have 86 in the name of all projects. X386, anyone? When the name decided on, the FreeBSD project decided to approach Walnut Creek CD ROM, a company who provided various forms of software on a CD that users can order and have mailed them. Remember, these were the early days of the internet, connections were slow and expensive, and there was no high speed broadband. Anyone who remembers the screeches and screaming of dial-up gnomes will know all too well. Walnut Creek was enthusiastic and supported the free BSD not only by providing high-speed internet access, but also by providing the resources to help FreeBSD and promote it in various forums. It was not long before the FreeBSD 1.0 was released in 1993, providing a valid upgrade path for users of 386BSD. It is worthy to note before the FreeBSD project had started, another group had kicked off a project based off 386BSD and the project still continues today known as NetBSD. With the conclusion of the Unix System Laboratories vs Berkeley Software Design lawsuit, the University of California Berkeley released an unencumbered version of BSD called 4.4 BSD Lite. With the settlement of the lawsuit, existing users of Net2 and their derived projects were highly encouraged to switch to 4.4 BSD Lite. Following many months of hard work, the project released 3 BSD 2.0 in November of 1994. With adding many new features and while now using the 4.4 BSD Lite as its base. From these beginnings, 3 BSD has continued to grow and evolve over the years, providing an ever stable base from everything from web servers to workstations. Sony even used it in their PlayStation 3 and 4 consoles. Netflix uses FreeBSD for their content delivery network. And Yahoo also was a heavy user of FreeBSD on their servers. At one stage, FreeBSD powered the majority of web servers on the internet before being overtaken by Linux. Amongst those who are familiar with FreeBSD, it is renowned for its stability, reliability and its performance. Unlike Linux, FreeBSD is developed as a complete operating system in its own right, so changes and improvements are always integrated from top to bottom. FreeBSD also has a very strong community surrounding it, and it's not only open, but it's always helpful to new users new to FreeBSD. Their documentation such as the FreeBSD handbook is renowned, and is often thought as second to none. The documentation that is maintained by users and developers of FreeBSD and is done on a volunteer basis and is often better than the documentation provided with some of the commercial products I've used. The FreeBSD Foundation was created not only to assist the FreeBSD project in its goals but also to advocate for and educate people on FreeBSD across many forms. I do highly encourage people to visit FreeBSD at freebsd.org and you can support the project via FreeBSD Foundation at freebsdfoundation.org. BSD, FreeBSD has a bright future and will not be going anywhere soon. In this video we covered the birth of Unix like a phoenix from the ashes of the Midlux project, where a fulfilling a need allowed the development of Unix to continue as well as flourish in an unsupporting environment. We also covered the arrival of Unix to Berkeley, where a determined group of individuals not only created a system in its own right, but participated in technology developments that helped create the modern world. Not only that, this system spawned a number of successful projects that continued to carry the mantle forward. And we quickly looked at the creation of BSD, FreeBSD, 
one of these successor projects, that continues to grow into the future today. This concludes this video. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.